Okay. We're not uh, we're not quite running with Swiss train precision, but I think proficiency, but we're doing better than uh, Amtrak usually does. So uh, we're going to try and keep on schedule. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday that that originally with the with the Quattron Center symposia, my goal was to have this become over time sort of an annual almost TED in criminal justice where we talk about innovations in the field. And so one way that we're doing that is we're going to actually have an, our next speaker who has actually given a TED talk which is a, a bucket list item that I'm extraordinarily jealous about. Um, so we, we have uh, Chris Segoyan here from the ACLU. Chris is the ACLU's principal technologist and a senior policy analyst uh, at the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. He's also a TED Senior Fellow. Uh, he has uh, a bachelor's in, com in uh, computer science from James Madison, a master's from Johns Hopkins in informatics, and also a PhD from the University of Indiana in informatics. Uh, and became the first in-house technologist at the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. Uh, there were a lot of newspaper articles about uh, the, the extraordinary creativity of the FTC and actually hiring a hacker to help them with digital information. Uh, and he created the, or co-created the Do Not Track Privacy Anti-Tracking Mechanism uh, that has now been adopted by all of the major web browsers. So to the extent you aren't being followed uh, when you use Chrome or something else, you have Chris to thank for that. Um, so, uh, Chris is going to talk about um, the work that he's done involving uh, the Stingray program. You might have heard somebody ask a question yesterday, uh, perhaps setting this talk up, uh, about the uh, use of Stingrays in law enforcement. And, uh, and Chris was involved in uh, sort of exposing uh, what the Stingray is and how it's being used in criminal justice, uh, and then what the role of the judiciary is in dealing with requests to use these technologies. Uh, and uh, since he knows a lot more about that than I do, I'm going to step off the stage and let him talk. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I always love talking to groups of lawyers. You guys are a really exciting bunch. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you actually a few stories. Um, and I want to weave the stuff I've done in the area of stingrays into some of the other things that are, that are happening right now and sort of really help you to understand a shift uh, in surveillance, a shift in the relationship between law enforcement and society. Uh, and, and it's the, the, the major shift, I'm going to give, give the gist of the talk away here, uh, is essentially we're moving into a world where law enforcement increasingly has to exploit security flaws in the technology that we rely on. And the Stingray story is an example of one. But the lessons from the Stingray story, I think, are relevant and equally apply to, to some of the other things that have been in the news, such as the FBI trying to hack into the San Bernardino iPhone, or the widespread use of hacking software by federal law enforcement agencies now. But let me step back. Um, we step back to 2011. I was in graduate school. I was finishing off my PhD. And I'd been in, in the surveillance field for a while. Uh, and, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, bonuses, benefits of being a prominent surveillance activist is that people email you and contact you and write to you uh, who believe that they have been tracked by the government. And some of these are well, um, well written emails, uh, and some of them are hand scribbled uh, letters, in some cases from people in jail. Some people think that the government has tracked them through um, believable means, and some people believe that President Obama is sending radio waves uh, into their brains uh, in, in cahoots with Fidel Castro. Uh, and I get these letters. I get them probably once a week or, or so. Um, and this isn't a, a benefit that I'm, the, that I'm the only person who, who gets. Many of my colleagues in the privacy and surveillance space uh, are routinely uh, contacted by people, and some of us are lucky enough to have our names, all of our names on the CC list, along with the president, the vice president, Glenn Greenwald, uh, and every other journalist you can think of. Uh, and so it's very easy when you receive one email a week from people who are who probably suffer from mental illness. It's very easy 
to immediately hit the delete button. And in 2011, uh, again, at the end of my PhD, sitting down one day and an email popped into my inbox from uh, a paralegal who was representing, uh, in the form of Shadow Council, uh, a gentleman who was sitting behind bars in Arizona. And this guy had written a 100-page pro se brief uh, describing at length the ways that the government had identified him in his case using a secret surveillance technology that sent signals through the wall of his house. This is, uh, at the time, this was, this was an absurd idea. Uh, I suspect most people in the room are lawyers, right? Can I see people nodding if they have a JD? Yeah, okay, there's a, there's a decent amount of lawyers. Um, a hundred, hundred page pro se briefs, like that's a pretty clear sign of, of instability. Um, and, and so, you know, when I, when I initially read it through, I thought, eh, this, this seems weird. But then I kept reading and the tech was actually solid. The technology that he was describing, uh, I knew about because I'd studied it in grad school as a computer scientist. I knew that it was possible to, uh, to essentially impersonate a cell phone tower. Um, cell phones, even though they seem very high tech, in many cases the technology that's in them is 10, 20, 30 years old. And security just wasn't baked in uh, when uh, the cell phone standards were being designed in the, in the 90s. Uh, one of the, the major flaws that continues to exist today is that cell phones do not know how to differentiate between a legitimate cell phone tower and a fake one. If your phone, you are an AT&T subscriber, and someone shows up with a cell tower that calls itself an AT&T tower, your phone's gonna talk to it. In the same way that if you've ever connected to the Wi-Fi at Starbucks uh, with your laptop, and then you go to any other Starbucks, it automatically connects, because the network is called the same thing. That same kind of flaw is present in phone networks. And so when I read this, this brief, I thought, oh, okay, I, I know about this. I studied this in grad school, but I thought this was only being used by like the military, by the spies. Um, and so, you know, I took the, the guy's brief to uh, the, the folks that who would then be, later become my colleagues at the ACLU, and they said, no, no, this is this guy's nut. Like, we're not touching this. And I took it to my friends at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and other prominent civil liberties group. But they said, no, no, this guy's nuts. We're not going to touch it. And every, every legal outfit I approached, every legal uh, expert, every surveillance expert I approached dismissed this. But I kept reading. And eventually, I was able to convince um, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal uh, to, to look into it. Two months later, it, there was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal. You know, and it's really funny. Once there's a front page story, suddenly everyone seems to think that it's actually an important thing. Uh, and, and so this, this actually, uh, th this is where I learned about the Stingray. Let me back up and say, you know, I think, you know, a couple of years ago when, when the protests started happening in, in Ferguson, Missouri, and you had this like vivid imagery of these heavily armored police with their, you know, M16 machine guns and with Kevlar helmets and vests and camouflage uniforms standing in front of these armored personnel carriers like the Bearcat, which looks truly terrifying, right? And you have this vivid imagery uh, of the police, but they're not really the police. They're basically the army. Um, and I think for many Americans, like this was a, a really, this was a wake up moment. And of course there was a huge racial dimension because most of the police were all white and the people in the community were all black. Um, but I think for many Americans, this was the first time they'd really seen the militarization of police in this country. Now this is not a new phenomenon. The US government has been funding SWAT teams and communities around the country for, for decades. But never before had we seen this kind of, these kinds of photographs on the front page of the newspaper. Um, you know, the Ferguson story, part of it, is about the trickle-down of technology that was intended for the military, that has trickled down first to federal law enforcement, and then eventually to state and local law enforcement. And we know the sources of money. The money comes through grants from DHS, 
from the Department of Homeland Security and through the use of civil asset forfeiture funds. Uh, all areas of great concern to people in the civil liberty space. You know, and I, one of the, the consistent criticisms that we heard after Ferguson is that these technologies and these tactics may be appropriate for Iraq and Afghanistan, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are appropriate for Main Street United States. And I agree with that. I mean, actually, I'm not even sure if they're appropriate in the war zone, but um, they're certainly not appropriate in, in, in America. The thing is, you know, the, the Ferguson Police Department is not the only police department in the country to have received a bear cap or to have received you know, military surplus machinery. There are, there are police departments that even receive tanks. Um, the thing is, though, most of these tanks don't get used. Most Bearcats are sitting on the back lot of the police department. There was a, a great New York Times story a couple of years ago about this, this phenomenon of, of military funding. And you know, there was one town, I think in Vermont, where they only use the Bearcat once a year for the annual Pumpkin Day Parade. Um, so even though there, there has been this trickle down for the most visually terrifying equipment, it really doesn't get used in the communities that much. You know, now, now the problem with the Ferguson, uh, the Ferguson imagery is that the Bearcats, the armored personnel carriers, the, ta the tanks, the helmets, the Kevlar vests, the machine guns, they're not the only things that are trickling down from the military and the intelligence community to law enforcement. There is also a huge array of surveillance technology whether it's stingrays that I'll talk about in a second, license plate readers, biometric scanners that are used to collect information from people when they're arrested, facial recognition technology, Wi-Fi scanning, and now hacking technology. These are all used. Now the difference, the two differences are, one, a bear cat looks terrifying, and a stingray looks like a piece of home hi-fi equipment. So you do not get the vivid, the vivid imagery with a stingray that you do with a bear cat. The second difference is that while the bear cat is going to sit on the back lot for a year without being used, the stingrays are being used in our communities every single day. Right? I, I, I'm not. I, I don't want to undersell the impact of sending armed SWAT teams into our communities. That is a, a serious problem. But the armored personnel carriers are really not being used very much. But the surveillance technology is in our communities every day, and we don't see it. We do at least get to see the SWAT team show up. We do have police photographing those, and people do have this instant shock reaction when they see armed police. But, you know, particularly here in Philadelphia, when the police, you know, go undercover and pretend to be a Google Street View van, as uh, the press learned yesterday, you don't get the instant reaction. You don't get the, you know, the community doesn't have a chance to, to learn or object to the surveillance technology. And to be clear, the surveillance technology that has been developed for the military and the intelligence community is truly terrifying in its scale, scope, and intrusiveness. All right, so let me, let me go into the Stingray for a few minutes. I'll explain what it does, how it works, how it's used, and then we'll zoom out a bit and, and see if we can learn a few things. So stingrays have been, have been used in one form or another by law enforcement in the United States since around 1995. Technology, 20 years old. This was originally created uh, by, uh, by the Germans, um, by, by a German company. Originally, it was marketed to the law enforcement and intelligence community. And for the first few years, this was really only available to Western governments. There were a small group of defense contractors who would sell this technology. It was extremely expensive, two, three hundred thousand dollars per device. And essentially a Stingray, and, and let, me, let me pause and say, Stingray is the name brand of a product, like Kleenex for tissues, like Hoover for a vacuum cleaner. Um, it is the Coca-Cola of surveillance devices, but there are Pepsis and Mountain Dews and 7-Ups as well. And, uh, but because the Stingray brand is the most ubiquitous among U.S. law enforcement, it has come to, to be, a, a, it's become genericized. Uh, it's, it's now a catch-all term. All right, so uh, with a Stingray, uh, the government can do several things. So 
I'm sure at some point, either as children yourself or now that you're adults with your own children or with your, the children in your family, you have probably played the game Marco Polo. Right? We all know how this works. Someone in the swimming pool, their eyes are closed and they say, Marco. And then everyone else says, Polo. Right. That's how a stingray works. So the stingray is the Marco. It's a cell tower that sends out a signal saying, hey everyone, I'm a new AT&T cell tower. I have the strongest signal strength of any tower nearby. Everyone use me for your calls. And suddenly all the phones in the vicinity identify themselves. They transmit their unique serial number to the stingray and then attempt to use the stingray for their calls in the future. All right, so let's unpack this. What does this mean? So the first thing is that for the stingray to announce itself, it must send signals in all directions. It must send signals through walls. It must send signals into bedrooms, into bathrooms, into purses, into pockets, and into vehicles. Wherever there might be a cell phone, the stingray's signals have to penetrate. Then all the phones that are in those private places then respond and announce themselves uh, and reveal their unique serial number. By listening to the direction that the announcement is coming from, the stingray can determine the location of the signals. In the same way that when your eyes are closed and you hear someone over there say, Polo, you sort of turn in that direction. And then you say, Marco, and then they say, Polo, and you keep going and going, sort of like hot, hot, cold, until you find the phone that you're looking for. And in fact, that is one of the things that law enforcement does. They will drive around in a van, perhaps an unmarked van disguised as a Google Street View van, uh, and then they will drive in concentric circles until they hear from the phone they're looking for. And once they get a faint signal, they will keep driving in that direction until it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay, so what happens once they get to a 20-story apartment building in downtown Philadelphia? They get out, and then the police use a handheld stingray where they can walk through the building with their little antenna, sending Marco signals into every apartment in the building as they walk through the halls until they can pinpoint the person to an individual room in a house. The first thing is identifiers. They can locate people. The device technology can be used to intercept calls and can be used to intercept text messages and can even be used to deliver hacking software to phones and take over phones remotely. Local law enforcement in this country swear up and down that they do not have the capability to intercept calls, text, and hack. But the, the, the technology does have that capability. Um, the way that stingrays work is they, they sort of trick the phone into talking to this fake tower. Well, if there's a real AT&T or Verizon tower nearby, how do they get you to talk to their fake tower? Well, they do two things. One, they pretend to be the strongest signal. But two, they jam the real towers. And so, even if you have no problem with the privacy intrusion that takes place when a stingray is being used, you sure as hell should have a problem with local law enforcement coming into a community and jamming phone networks so that people cannot make or receive calls. Now, we've been told that the, ma the main manufacturer of the Stingray has built a mechanism into their technology that allows 911 calls to go through. We've been told that. Uh, but recent docu uh, documents recently released from Canadian law enforcement, who also use Stingrays, revealed that the 911 pass-through feature did not work reliably. And so Canadian police were instructed to not use Stingrays for greater than three-minute bursts so that if you were in a real emergency and there was a stingray nearby, you would only have to make, wait three minutes to be able to make a 911 call. All right, so they jam the calls of everyone in order to track people. Because of this jamming feature, uh, stingrays are also, can also be used in high security environments, jails, to, uh, you can uh, whitelist and blacklist phones. So you might whitelist the telephones of the prison guards and then prevent uh, smuggled in cell phones from working. We know that um, convoys in Iraq and Afghanistan travel with stingrays to block uh, burner phones from being used to detonate IEDs. We know that the president's security detail 
uh, has a Stingray or something like a Stingray with it so that the cell phone numbers of people who are known to have threatened the president, if they show up anywhere around the president, Secret Service knows. Obviously, there are critical national security and public safety uses for this technology. I think everyone would reasonably agree that the president's safety is extremely important, that the safety of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan is, is important. But that doesn't mean we should be shipping this technology stateside. Um, and so this technology is re really, really powerful. And, and as, I, as I hinted before, you know, this is not a, a, a sniper's gun that shoots one bullet at one target. This is, you know, uh, sp spray and pray. Uh, it's like a shotgun that shoots in all directions. And there's no way to target a stingray at just the target, at, at just the bad guy you're looking for. Um, the best that law enforcement can do is throw away the information about innocent people once it's been collected, once they have already sent signals into the living rooms and bedrooms and children's rooms of innocent people in a neighborhood. And so that's what the tech does. How do we know what the tech does? Well, you know, when I received that email in 2011, there wasn't any information about the use of stingrays by law enforcement. I had learned about the technology in grad school, but really in sort of the theoretical context. And in, in a couple European countries, the use of this technology is acknowledged. In Germany, the, um, the parliament receives a report every year detailing how many times it's been used. And so we know a little bit from Europe. So then how do we learn you know, what's been going on? So I don't know how many uh, Fourth Amendment scholars there are in the room. Folks who know anything a lot about the Fourth Amendment? No? All right. Uh, so there's this thing called the mosaic theory. The gist of it is you take a lot of things that aren't that important and you put them together and then suddenly you get something important. Um, and this actually came from, this, this is now a, a feature in privacy law, but originally it came from FOIA where the government has asserted in the past that unclassified information taken with other unclassified information taken with un other unclassified information can reveal classified information. And so I spent the last four years putting that jigsaw puzzle together. Um, so starting in 2011, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours Googling for everything I could find. And it turns out that when uh, a local law enforcement department, say, Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Phoenix, Arizona, the toughest sheriff in the nation. When his department receives a DHS grant to buy a Stingray, so they get $300,000 from DHS, and they want to buy the Stingray, well, only one company sells the Stingray, the Harris Corporation. And to get an exception to the normal rules that require competitive bidding by government, they have to request from the city council permission to seek sole source authorization to buy the device. When they seek that permission, they create a paper trail. They have to list what they're buying and who they're buying it from, and they have to have an invoice and a quote, and in some cases, it even includes some marketing materials from the manufacturers. And so over the course of about two years, from city councils around the country, I was able to figure out who had purchased this equipment, uh, the city of Miami even uh, published a two-page uh, advertising brochure for the device, and so we're able to suddenly start to get bits and pieces of information. Within about a year and a half, it was clear that this was in use in dozens of law enforcement agencies around the, around the country. But the lawyers that I work with were puzzled. Right? We knew that this technology was in, all, was in, in the hands of, of state and local law enforcement around the country. Baltimore, um, San Francisco, uh, folks in the, in the Bay Area, Massachusetts, Texas, but we couldn't find any stingray cases in PACER. We couldn't see the fruits of the surveillance technology showing up in applications for search warrants, in indictments. You know, where was the technology? Like, was, it, was this like the Bearcat? Was this sitting on the back lot? Or was this being used? So eventually we dug more and more and more and we learned that local law enforcement agencies had been required by the FBI, uh, as a condition of purchasing the technology, they were forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement in order to prevent the public from learning about the technology. These non-disclosure agreements prohibited the uh, police from disclosing the use of it or any details about it, 
And some law enforcement agencies interpreted that non-disclosure agreement to even prohibit them from telling judges that they were using this technology. What we ended up finding out was that law enforcement agencies around the country, federal, state, and local, were applying for traditional surveillance orders that looked like a request to the phone company, and then were using those orders and then allow, using those orders as, an, as authorization for the police themselves to surveil. What this meant was that the courts didn't know what they were being asked to surveil, or what they were being asked to authorize. So this really sort of hit, uh, hit a peak, I guess in late 2013, early 2014. Uh, USA Today did a great front page story. Once the Stingrays really blew the lid on, on this stuff. And what's great about Gannett, which owns USA Today, is they own all these like small town papers around the country. And so the, the investigative team at Gannett, they wrote 80% of the story. This is what a Stingray is, this is the history, this is the secrecy. But then Gannett had all these small town reporters call up their chief of police and, say, and get a quote saying, you know, you know, are the police in Indianapolis using a stinger? And then they have to, oh, you know, either we can't talk about it, or we respect privacy, or you know, we're only collecting information about really bad guys, and we're using it to find missing children, and leave us alone. Um, but they like insert that one, that one paragraph. And there was one reporter in Tacoma, Washington, uh, Kate Martin, a dogged investigative reporter, who went the extra mile. So she had a quote. <clears throat> from the chief of police saying that, the, that they, yes, they had a device, but they always got search warrants to authorize the use. They all, it was always authorized by the court. So Kate Martin called the chief judge uh, of, of the court and said, so what about these stingray orders that you guys are authorizing? And the chief judge said, what's a stingray? Uh, you know, if there's one thing that the courts don't like, it's being lied to. And that single story led to a huge change in Tacoma, Washington. It led to the uh, chief prosecutor being called in uh, for an unpleasant meeting with the judges. They totally reformed their processes. They created um, a clear application describing the technology, describing how it works, describing its impact on innocent people. They agreed to get real search warrants. And that laid the groundwork for then Washington State to become the first state in the country to pass legislation requiring that standard across the whole state. So that really sort of blew things up. And it, as this was taking place, you know, the, the secrecy around stingrays was crumbling. Local law enforcement were, were saying, we'd love to say more, but we have this non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and eventually the pressure on the FBI became too great. Right, and the FBI said, oh, you know, the locals have been misinterpreting the non-disclosure agreement. We didn't ever intend for them to deceive uh, the courts or, the, or withhold things from defense counsel. We just had the first state appeals court in the country uh, uh, rule on, on a stingray issue. Uh, the court, this was in Maryland just last month, the court ruled that the uh, search warrant applications were objectively disingenuous um, and held that every stingray operation required a warrant. And there are hundreds of cases in Maryland now that could be uh, could be reopened up and, and, and potentially tossed. So the, the wall of secrecy around stingrays is crumbling. We now know that state and local law enforcement agencies have been using these for some time. DOJ and the Department of, Just of Homeland Security, DOJ and DHS, have both published voluntary stingray policies in the last six months where they agree to get warrants now. They agree to be candid with the courts and des describe how the technology works what its impact is on third parties, and to minimize data collected about innocent people. They still are not really addressing the issue of jamming the phone calls of innocent people, but there is some progress. But let me explain the reason that I'm so obsessed with this. And it, even though I work for the ACLU, even though I'm a, I'm a privacy advocate, I actually think the privacy issues with the Stingray, the government privacy issues are, are the least exciting. And now that we do have a warrant standard at the federal level, and now that states are moving in this direction, I think you know, most of the issues are being addressed vis-a-vis -vis the legal standards. <clears throat> Again, I, I think it's a little bit messed up for local law enforcement to be jamming phone calls. And I don't, I don't actually think that a judge should be able to authorize the jamming of calls for an entire neighborhood, but that's, that's a separate matter. 
There's another aspect of the Stingray issue, which I think is even more fascinating, which is this. Um, in 1994, I think it was then, uh, there was a scandal, a big scandal in D.C., uh, in which a Florida couple had intercepted the phone calls of Newt Gingrich and John Boehner and other Republicans. So let me back up and say, the telephones in the 1990s were even less secure than the phones that we have today. And you could listen to people's phone calls in the 90s just by going to Radio Shack and buying a radio scanner and then like tuning to the dial. You could just listen to people's calls. So this couple, it's like it was a, a, a Florida couple, they're like driving down the highway with their radio scanner on and they hear senior GOP officials talking on a conference call and they did, I think, what anyone would do, which is they put in a cassette tape, recorded it, and then provided that to the Democrats. Just kidding, <laughs> don't do that. It's really a bad idea. It almost certainly violates the law. Um, so that led to a congressional ethics probe. I mean, it was a whole, whole scandal. But that led to Congress taking an interest in the security of phone networks, because Congress cares more about one thing than anything else, and that's themselves. Um, <laughs> So they held this, a series of hearings. They even got a computer hacker to come and tap analog phone calls during a congressional hearing. It was like really <coughs> exciting. And then Congress sort of fixed it in the way that Congress fixes technology problems, which is they created a mandate that the companies that manufacture radio scanners create a filter that would stop them from intercepting phone calls. They, would, they didn't want to force the phones to be secure. They wanted to make it more difficult for people to buy equipment that could listen to calls. And that didn't do anything for the millions of scanners that were already in people's hands. So Congress didn't really fix the problem, but the phone industry moved from the insecure analog phones of the 90s eventually to secure digital phones, more secure digital phones. And there's this great moment in 1996. The chairman, or so the, the, the president of the Cell Phone Lobbying Association, CTIA, it's like the big you know, industry rep, rep, uh, organization that represents AT&T and Verizon, and he's there, and he's telling the Congressional Committee that you know, the industry is moving to, to digital phones, and that's going to improve the security. But the, the security of digital phones then was really based on the price of interception. That in 1996, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for someone to intercept digital calls. And that eventually, the cost of those devices, the cost of interception would go down from 300000 to you know to 100000 to 50000 to 1,000. So what's great, this is like the best DC story ever, the chief lobbyist for the phone industry who told Congress in 1996 that if they didn't do something that eventually cell phone surveillance would drop in price. That guy's name is Tom Wheeler, who is the current chairman of the FCC. So the FCC chairman right now warned Congress 20 years ago that if they didn't do anything, our phone calls would be vulnerable. And what he said in 1996 happened exactly as predicted. So in the mid-90s, there were only a couple companies that manufactured cell phone surveillance technology. They were in Germany, in the UK, and in the United States. Today, you can buy these devices from companies in China, and Israel, and Russia, and Pakistan, and Malaysia, India, Canada, there, there are countless companies selling this. And of course, it's a competitive market, and the cost of technology go down every year. You can now go onto Alibaba, which is the Chinese eBay, and buy an IMSI catcher, which is the generic name, that's like the, the Kroger soda brand name of the Stingray. Uh, you can buy one for 2,000 bucks. 20 years ago, it cost $300,000 to spy on digital phone calls. And today, you can buy a device for 2,000 bucks that does it, or if you're tech savvy, you can build one yourself for a few hundred dollars. And three years ago, in a congressional committee room, I brought a PhD student from Berkeley in with a homemade IMSI catcher, and we tapped the calls of congressional staff. So the thing that I love about the Stingray issue, and the reason I'm so obsessed with this, is not because law enforcement has been sending signals into the living rooms of innocent people. It's not because they've been jamming uh, the phone calls of innocent people. It's because the US government has known for 20 years that our cell phone network was vulnerable to spying, that our phones did not have real security. And rather than push the phone companies into securing our phone networks, Rather than ensuring 
that lawyers could have confidential calls with their clients, that suicide hotline calls and rape crisis calls would be secure. Law enforcement did everything they could to suppress public disclosure of these vulnerabilities, and the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which has jurisdiction over the security of our phone networks, refused to disclose documents about the vulnerabilities and instead licensed the Stingray manufacturers. Every new Stingray device is licensed by the FCC. We have been fighting for five years to learn just how insecure our phone networks are, and the FCC and FBI have fought us every single step. But they're not, you know, the FBI and the DEA and the Marshals and the ATF and the NYPD and all the state and local law enforcement agencies who have Stingrays, they're not the only ones who have Stingrays. Stingrays are the most useful when you are operating in a place where you do not have the permission of the phone company. If you want to intercept calls, the police want to intercept calls, they don't need a Stingray, they can call up Verizon with a Title III order. Stingrays are great when you're the CIA and, you're, and you want to spy on Angela Merkel's calls. And they're great when you're the KGB or the FSB and you want to listen to Secretary of State's calls. Stingrays are great for espionage, amazing for espionage. And the fact is that every government that wants it now has this technology. And of course they're using it in Washington, D.C. Of course they're using it in New York. If you are uh, a, a sophisticated criminal organization, you can capture market moving information by listening to the phone calls of bankers, of the CEOs of firms. If you're you know, a, uh, an industrial espionage minded kind of company, you can go sit outside a Silicon Valley startup and listen to the CEOs calls and steal their secret sauce. We are at a crisis point where we do not have confidence, or I don't have confidence, in the security of our phone network. And the only reason that you have confidence is because until my talk today, you didn't know how bad things were. <laughs> so, about eight years ago, there was a gigantic scandal in India when um, private investigators and the paparazzi started using IMSI catchers, the Stingrays, that they'd imported from an Israeli manufacturer. Uh, and they used these, these devices to intercept the calls of Indian politicians taking bribes and having affairs with Bollywood film stars. Apparently it's more glamorous to be a politician in, in India than it is here. Um, so they, these calls were played back uh, on, the, on the news, they were printed in the newspaper, uh, and it led to a, a huge scandal which ultimately led to the, India's Prime Minister announcing that he had no faith in the security of India's phone system. Now the phones that people use in India are no different than the phones that we have here. Our phones are just as insecure as the phones in India. I think the only difference is the people who are spying on calls in the US aren't printing it on the front page of the newspaper. But our calls are insecure, uh, and our government has done nothing to tell us about it because law enforcement wanted to be able to exploit this for their own use. And there's no way to secure our phone calls from criminals and foreign governments and hackers while still allowing law enforcement to use this technology. <coughs> So, I mean, I think, you know, you don't have to be a genius to see parallels between this and the debate that's taking place right now about cybersecurity and about whether or not we should have encryption that the government cannot get access to. You know, I, I think the Stingray episode is a good lesson in that what it shows us is that if there are weaknesses in, our, in the technology that we use, we cannot trust that the government will shift from exploitation to fixing once it becomes clear that others can exploit these flaws too. So the good news, I don't want to be like a downer the whole day, sorry, like, oh my goodness, the phones are insecure, everything sucks. Um, so the good news is that actually the tools to protect yourself are so easy to use and in your hands uh, that it's, it's almost shocking and, and surprising that they're not more widely used. So who in the room has an iPhone? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Who in the room has used FaceTime? FaceTime is encrypted. Who in the room uses WhatsApp? WhatsApp is encrypted. So the, the thing that's the most frustrating for me as an activist and an advocate is that the tools to make calls that are so secure that the government cannot listen to them, 
They're so secure that a foreign government or that a hacker cannot listen to them. They're already on your phone. The problem is, is that the companies that sell these products and advertise these apps, they don't advertise them as secure services, right? So when you think of FaceTime, you think of Apple's marketing, it's like, oh, you know, you're traveling long distance, you want to like stay in touch with your spouse or your kids or in some cases even your dog. Um, and, and, I mean, there are commercials of people like having FaceTime chats with their dogs. Um, <laughs> And so people are already using this. They just don't know that FaceTime is more secure than a regular phone call. The irony here is that you, for the lawyers in the room, you are probably having a more secure conversation with your spouse about whether or not you should bring milk home than your clients. Uh, so I've spent two years trying to convince the legal community to use encryption more. Uh, I've spoken to partners at law firms, I've tried to get law firms to encrypt their websites, I've tried to get law firms to encrypt their websites, uh, sorry, law schools, congratulations, this law school uses HTTPS, your website is encrypted by default, you are, uh, you are in the top 5% of law schools uh, for, for the security of your website. Um, but you know, the, the conversation I've had with so many partners at firms, when I say you should be having encrypted calls with your clients, you should, be, you should ensure that every call where you discuss attorney-client privilege information is conducted over a encrypted telephone line. And their response is, oh, well, we'll do it if the client asks for it. You know, when I go to my doctor's office, I don't have to tell him to wash his hands. My doctor practices good hygiene. You know, I see him doing it, like, when before he touches my face. Um, <laughs> At the same for my dentist, right? Like you expect, you expect healthcare workers to employ good hygiene. Why are lawyers also not employing good hygiene? Why do you have to be forced to? Why does the client have to ask? I don't have to ask my dentist to, to wash his hands. So the, the frustrating part of this is that the tools are already there. People just don't know that they need to use these things because A, they don't know how insecure phone calls are. Uh, and B, they don't know how easy it is to encrypt. And so, um, you know, I think that the lesson from, from the Stingray story really is that, you know, law enforcement has a tough job to do. Their job is to catch the bad guys. But that's all they're focused on. Their job is not to ensure that our phone networks are secure from hackers or criminals or foreign governments. Uh, their job is just to catch the bad guys, and everything they can do to make their job easier, they will do, and I don't blame them for that. The problem is that when the tools that they use leave the rest of us vulnerable to spying by foreign governments, by hackers, by the paparazzi, that's a problem. And when they do so in secret, through non-disclosure agreements, through classification, by actually lying uh, in, uh, in Florida, the police were instructed by the U.S. Marshal Service to, uh, in court proceedings, describe information that came from stingrays as coming from a confidential informant. The same in Baltimore. Um, when they actually lie and engage in parallel construction to hide the surveillance technologies, that's a problem, particularly when public knowledge of those technologies could lead to a more secure uh, communications infrastructure. And so, to wrap it up, you know, uh, the Stingray has been with us for 20 years. It's taken us 20 years to get federal standards for this. It's taken us 20 years for the courts to finally get a chance to grapple with this and to hold that use of this technology requires a, a warrant and that it is a fourth amendment search. Uh, it has taken us 20 years to pierce the veil of secrecy. You know, the Stingray is 20 years old. What about the next thing? You know, I. I flew to Seattle in February and testified in a case where the FBI used sophisticated hacking software to hack 1,300 people in a single operation. 1,300 people located around the country. It's a child porn case, so it's not very sympathetic. But 1,300 people with a single warrant signed by a magistrate in Virginia. This is an unprecedented scale of searching. Never before in the history of law enforcement have the police been able to search 1,300 places simultaneously with a team of two or three agents. This is just a crazy, crazy scale of efficiency. And everything about the technology they used is secret. Just yesterday, the judge in that case considered evidence in camera and ex parte 
proceeding and then ultimately ruled that the government didn't have to turn over the hacking software to the defense. So what's happening, what happened in the Stingray arena is happening now with hacking and it will happen with the next surveillance technology and the next surveillance technology and the next surveillance technology because we do not have a system in this country to adequately oversee the use of new surveillance technologies either before they're used or early into their use. We have to wait for law enforcement to screw up, for them to accidentally post documents online, and for those documents to be found by activists and journalists. But this is not a system to oversee the surveillance state. This is not an adequate system, and it shouldn't take 20 years to police this stuff. And, and to be clear, had the FBI not allowed state and locals to buy the Stingray, we still wouldn't know anything about it. The only reason we know anything is because the state and locals were sloppy and they got caught. But the feds are way, way smarter. And that's why, you know, 15 years ago, the FBI set up their dedicated hacking team. It wasn't until 2007 that the first news article about an operation was revealed. That was a case where they hacked a teenager who'd called in bomb threats to his high school. And it wasn't until 2014 that I learned that the way they'd hacked that teenager's computer was by pretending to be the Associated Press. Some of you may have read about that in the news in the last year or two. The FBI has been in the hacking business for 15 years, and we still know basically nothing about it. And so while it's great that we now know so much about Stingrays, and it's great that we're now, just yesterday, uh, a bipartisan group of, of uh, congressman introduced legislation to require a warrant for stingrays for federal, state, and local law enforcement. While it's great that we've had that reform, what about hacking? What about license plate readers? What about biometric scanners? What about facial recognition? What about all of the other surveillance technologies that have trickled down from the military and the intelligence community? The technologies that we get from alpha to beta to ready to go from Somalia to Main Street America. What about those technologies? What do we do to ensure that they're not going to be abused, that there are appropriate procedures, that the courts are kept in the loop, and that we're not all left vulnerable because that's the way that the technologies work? Thank you for your time. So we do have some time for uh, questions for Chris. Uh, if anybody wants to step up to the to the microphone, I think um, you know the takeaways for me are it's a good thing I'm not going to be swimming because the tinfoil hat I'll be wearing would probably get washed <laughs> off. Um, but, but Chris, while we're, uh, I, I do have a question for you, sort of using moderator's privilege here. Um, you know. The, the technology is at some point going to emerge. There's a, an on, you know, innovation is going to keep coming. Is it the, the you know, and, and there, there are good things, as you say, that, 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 are, that are used for this. If you're, you know, if you are going to, going to deal with 1,300 uh, purveyors of child pornography, the, the national security examples, is it the transfer of this technology outside the national security realm or the lack of transparency that's the bigger issue? And how do we deal with the fact that there are useful uses for this, but then dangerous additional uh, ramifications? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great question. So many people think of the Patriot Act as a piece of horrible privacy invading legislation. So that, there are actually some good parts of the Patriot Act. So I know it's weird to hear someone from the ACLU say, like, I love the Patriot Act. But um, I, I don't love the whole thing. But there's one section I like, which is that prior to 2001, it was the position of the Department of Justice that they could use stingrays without any kind of court order. And the Patriot Act modified the language for the pen register statute in a really obscure way that basically meant they had to get the easiest of the surveillance orders to get. Now, it wasn't a difficult order. It was a, it's a pen register order is a, is a relevance to an ongoing investigation, so it's super low bar. But before the Patriot Act, they didn't even need to ask for any author authorization from a court. And you know, I think reasonable people can agree or disagree about whether or not the government should have to show probable cause, whether or not you know, they should be able to scoop up information about innocent people. I think most people can agree they shouldn't be hiding things from judges. I mean, that's like a pretty disgusting practice. But I think for a democracy to function, and particularly for surveillance, which surveillance technology and surveillance by the government has a corrosive effect on democracy. Well, I mean, you go back throughout history, and surveillance is always used against people who pose 
a threat to those in power. Whether it's you know, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X or Cesar Chavez, all of our civil rights leaders were spied on. Not like agents going rogue, but like authorized spying. So we need strict oversight of surveillance. And I think the biggest problem right now, whether it's, whether it's the Stingray or the hacking or these other things, is that the position of the FBI and DOJ is they don't need to go to Congress to ask for new authorization to use new technologies. They, they shoehorn their new technologies into existing surveillance statutes. So a pen register, for example, this is a, a surveillance order that lets the government know who's calling incoming and outgoing calls. Surveillance and pen register, uh, pen register and trap and trace. In the 1920s, a pen register was literally a paper tape with a printer attached to a phone line and it would like print out the numbers and then the police would have to show up in person and then collect the tape, like the stock tape. I, I actually bought one uh, on eBay a few weeks ago. So I have like a 1920s pen register in my office. Um, when you know, phone networks were digitized and pen registers became software, they didn't change the name of the statute. They just kept using the thing. And when the government could track phones, they went to pen register orders. So today, or until, well, until the judges started saying no, but for about 10 years, uh, law enforcement were using an order that described the technology from the 1920s to, look, to obtain location information on someone's cell phone. And cell phones, of course, didn't exist in 1920. Um, you know, if, if as a democracy, our, our elected officials decide that it's a good thing for the government to be able to hack into people's webcams and remotely enable their webcams, or hack into 1,300 computers pursuant to a single warrant, like, I'm not a big fan of that, but at least then it's the system working. But if law enforcement can, you know, if the FBI can go to Booz Allen or Raytheon, give them a couple hundred thousand dollars, buy the hacking software, put it into use, and then never have to disclose how they collected that evidence, how do we effectively oversee the technology? And uh, again, I think reasonable people can disagree about how it should be used. But Congress should be in the loop. And we haven't had a single hearing on government hacking. And the first congressional stingray hearing was this spring, 20 years after the use of this technology and five years after the first front page story about stingrays. That is not a way to do oversight. Yes, sir. Um, what about uh, the, the private uh, data sharing that's going on, which, I mean, I, I personally see as a bigger issue. Uh, I mean, the government can arrest you, but, the, but how we're um, ranked and, and how we uh, are perceived has a lot to do with our data that's, that can be sold from one company to another, and I imagine can be sold to a government entity as well. So, um, one, what are your concerns about the private corporate data that's being collected on people, and two, how would someone protect themselves, say, their communications, their browsing history, their location, etc., if they wanted to? Oh, man, that's a tough question. So I, I used to do consumer privacy stuff. Uh, I worked at the Federal Trade Commission. I investigated Facebook and Twitter and Netflix when I was in the FTC. It was, I, mean, really, I mean, as a civil liberties advocate and as a privacy advocate, writing a subpoena that goes to a tech company is awesome. Like they have, they have, you're like writing a legal demand and they have to give you their stuff. It's, now I know like why the cops have a fun time uh, with that part of their job. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll be very, very upfront with you. Uh, there's a pendulum that shifts in the privacy space from the government and back to the companies. And you know, prior to you know, probably 2011, all of my time was spent on consumer privacy. I was working on ad blocking stuff, on do not track, on things that would allow consumers to protect themselves from spying by you know, search engines. And uh, I, I filed three Federal Trade Commission complaints against tech companies. I got Dropbox to stop lying about the encryption they were using. Um, and then the surveillance stuff became hot. And then Snowden came out and he was, became our client. And you know, the ACLU only has a few people working on privacy. We have limited resources, and you know we, we downsized by 10% last year. We laid off people. Um, you know when the financial markets go go south, our donors lose money, and then they donate less money. We don't have the resources to staff up a full team to do consumer privacy and a full team to do government surveillance. And so you know we we go 
and focus on the things that we think are the most important right now. You know, if, if you ask me in a, in a moment of honesty, do I think that the tech companies are getting a, a free ride right now while the entire privacy community is focused on the FBI and the NSA? Hell yeah. And it really disturbs me. And I think you know, even more so than the Googles and Facebooks of the world, I think the data broker industry, firms like Axiom, ChoicePoint, uh, these firms are, are really parasites who uh, collect information about people, sell it to others, and don't give consumers a way to get out of their databases, and, and then bear no responsibility for misleading or incorrect information that they have. And we don't have federal regulation of data brokers, and the fact is, is that you know, they're so big now that they have lobbying power to ensure that they're never going to get shut down. We're stuck with data brokers. You know, we're stuck with the, these incumbents, and you know, the Federal Trade Commission only has limited power, and the Chamber of Commerce and all the big companies lobby against the FTC getting more power. So we're, we're sort of screwed for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be you know, so, so depressing on that front, but you know, if, if you want civil society to be more engaged, either you have to, on, on consumer privacy issues, either you have to wait a few years for the, the FBI, NSA stuff to, to slow down, or donate you know, a billion dollars to, uh, to a bunch of groups because we don't have the, the resources to focus on everything. Very quick question. I've heard you speak before about something, an entity, I think in the executive branch called the Vulnerability Equities Council. Process. Process. Can you just explain briefly, yeah, very briefly sure. what it is? So uh, when, so as I was sort of describing in my talk, it used to be that the government would use surveillance features built into our communication system. So for a hundred years, the phone companies have helped the government. Phone networks are designed for surveillance. You know, there's a dedicated team at AT&T and Verizon who provide wiretaps and customer data. But as consumers have moved from communication services that are designed to be surveilled to pr privacy protecting and secure communication services like WhatsApp and FaceTime, that are not designed to be surveilled, or they're using, you know, they're storing their data on an iPhone that's encrypted, for law enforcement to get access to our data, they now need to basically hack our devices. Whether they're hacking our web browser, or hacking our phone, or hacking our secure voice channel, they need to hack us. And while law enforcement has been doing this for 15 years, the NSA has been doing it for even longer. Uh, and so, you know, in order to hack a terrorist suspect or a foreign government or a drug dealer, the government needs to know about security flaws in the technology that we use. And when the FBI or the NSA or the CIA or JSOC, all of whom have their own hacking components, when they acquire a security vulnerability from a defense contractor, there's supposed to be an interagency process whereby different parts of the government sit down at the table and say, is the advantage to U.S. law enforcement and national security by using this thing greater, or is the harm to the U.S. economy from foreign governments and hackers and other parties exploiting it worse? So they're supposed to like balance the equities. And we learned about this a couple of years ago. We still don't really know who's on it. We know who's not on it. And there's no one from the defensive side of the government. The Federal Trade Commission's not there. NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, is not there. There is a defensive side of NSA who's there, but um, that's like the, the, the bear with a smile uh, as opposed to the bear with a frown. Um, and, and so they're supposed to make those evaluations. What, uh, the, in a Washington Post story yesterday, we were told that, that they typically report about 300 vulnerabilities a year but the government typically holds onto the vulnerabilities for up to six months at a time, so they can use them first before disclosing them. So it's sort of like, hey, I took all the money out of the wallet that I found, here's your wallet back, but I'm gonna keep the money. Um, and we learned recently that the, the vulnerability that the FBI exploited in the iPhone in the San Bernardino case, the FBI did not submit to that interagency review because the contract was structured in such a way that the FBI never bought the vulnerability, they bought a license to use it. <laughs> So it doesn't seem like this mechanism is really uh, robust. Um, you know, everything really seems to be that the, the, the deck is stacked in favor of exploiting flaws and hacking and not in favor of securing our, our communications and our data. And it's surprising because for the last five years, we've been hearing 
constantly from government officials that cybersecurity is this huge threat, that cybersecurity threats are the biggest threat we face, greater than terrorism, yet the government, when they get the chance, seems to favor offense over defense. All right, thank you again. Thank you.